Um, my name is Adam Pumphrey. As Jeanette mentioned, I'm here to, to talk about Bro. Uh, the title of the talk is a Bro Primer. Uh, that gets a little bit of confusion. It's not actually something you can pick up in the paint department at Home Depot. Uh, this is a, an introduction to Bro, um, kind of geared towards the folks that are, are just getting started with Bro. Um, real quickly about me, I've been in the industry for about 17 years, um, predominantly working in network defense, network uh, threat detection, uh, forensics, malware analysis. Um, in about 2009, a group of our engineers came forward with a, a recommendation uh, for a, a, a tool replacement for this tool stack that we were using at the time. Um, and it was Bro in, in its early stages, or not earliest stages, but uh, earlier stages, I guess. Um, and it produced a, a wealth of, of log data. And that was my, kind of my first contact with Bro as a network monitoring tool. It quickly became the, uh, the kind of the solution of choice, and it's kind of been part of the solution stack ever since. I've gone on to, to work in a variety of IR teams and, and stand-up security operation centers. Um, and Bro has always been a part of the solution stack. I personally do not come from a programming background. As I mentioned, it's primarily network monitoring, uh, network defense. Um, I started out as kind of a router, a router jockey, you know, a network engineer, and got into network traffic analysis. Um, the, the value of Bro is, is pretty evident to people when they first get exposed to the data set, um, but I think that's something that, that, that takes a little more time is to realize what additional value you can get out of a Bro deployment by learning and, and interacting with the programming language. Um, some of the, the, the kind of the foundational concepts that uh, Bro is kind of built on, and I'll remind you that I'm, I don't work for the, I'm not a Bro developer, I don't work for Bro.org. Um, I'm kind of a practitioner that, that learned out of necessity, so you know, take that into consideration here. Um, but some of the foundational concepts I feel like are, are really beneficial um, and necessary to, uh, to get going with the language. So um, real quick, just to just kind of do a quick survey, who in the room here is kind of new to Bro or just kind of getting familiar with, with the tool? Okay, great. That's, uh, that's actually a lot more folks than I anticipated. That's good to know. Um, so this talk is, is predominantly aimed at you, um, for those that are uh, kind of pursuing a similar mission and trying to get the most out of the Bro deployment and, and getting to know the programming language. So I'd like to break uh, Bro down into kind of two core components. That's the event engine and the script interpreter. Uh, packets enter the event engine. Um, analysis takes place. I'm, I'm kind of oversimplifying here just for the sake of the discussion. Um, analysis takes place of those packets, and the event engine turns the, those packets and that packet data into higher level events. Uh, those events are then made available to scripts written in Bro script um, by way of event handlers. Those event handlers do some processing of the, the records that, that are contained in the events that are generated, and then in some cases they themselves can also generate events. And it, uh, it, kinda, it can kind of happen in a cyclic fashion. Uh, um, you know, you can have an uh, event handler generate another event that's sub subsequently handled uh, by another event handler. Um, and then as this is all going on, of course, Bro produces its log streams. There's a, a, a ton of uh, very useful information um, emitted in the log streams there. And it's also capable of extracting files out of the streams. And that's uh, some, some functionality that uh, most people are, are very interested in, uh, in particular in the, in the world of uh, network defense for uh, you know, um, a local network. So uh, a couple of things I want to talk, talk about or touch on real quickly before I get into the rest of it. Um, kind of some assumptions I'm making here. Um, as a Bro user, you're aware of the local.bro policy file. This, this ships with Bro. Um, it's kind of the, the, the primary mechanism for you to make customizations of your Bro deployment. Uh, you can redefine variables here. It's, it's a full-blown script file, uh, Bro script file, so you can, you can technically include any Bro script in this file. Um, as you get into more, more advanced deployments, you're probably going to want to split those scripts out into separate files just for organization's sake. Um, the second thing is that uh, Bro uses what's called a load directive, and that kind of gets things going. Um, from an execution perspective. Very, very similar to include and import from other languages. Um, but that load directive specifies a script or a module. 
um, that you would like the script interpreter to load and execute. Uh, the final thing, and I think this is something that's critical to any Bro deployment, is making, help, helping Bro be more aware of your environment. And I, you can draw the association to Snort or Suricata environment variables here, um, but I really think it, local nets and local zones um, that belong to the site module are actually more powerful than that. There's built-in functionality, um, some built-in functions in particular that allow you to do kind of locality tests on IP addresses and even uh, DNS names to see if those DNS names uh, belong to a particular DNS zone. So one of the, the core concepts and something I've, I've mentioned briefly already is the notion of an event. Um, Johanna's talk just uh, outlined some of the, the new SSL events that are gonna be in an upcoming release. Um, and there are a ton of events um, that are there available to you for a wide variety of, of analysis tasks. Um, showed this slide a couple, uh, this diagram a couple slides ago. Um, the next few slides are going to kind of concentrate on what goes on uh, between the event engine and the script interpreter, kind of the interplay between those two. Um, to kind of step into this a little bit deeper from a different angle, actually, um, a little. Um, so Bro starts up and establishes a runtime. Um, Bro can declare events, and Bro core subsequently creates event queues. And the script interpreter gets going and executes those load directives and, and parses scripts and starts uh, running, running the, excuse me, ex executing those commands. Some of those scripts may also de declare events and subsequently event, other event queues are created. Those scripts can also declare event handlers and they attach to these event queues in a priority. Uh, I have the range of positive 10 to negative 10 here um, and this is, a, this is an attribute that's actually assigned to event handlers when they're created and when they're defined. I think the, uh, the range can actually go beyond this, but in practice, you typically want to stay within a, a positive 10 and a negative 10. So as packets enter Bro Core, again, Bro Core, uh, Bro does the analysis on these packets, generates higher level events. They enter these event queues where they're made available to the event handlers in the priority that they set when they're defined. And then in some cases, those event handlers also generate events and they enter event queues where they're subsequently handled by other handlers. So I've been kind of talking generically about events for a couple of minutes here, um, but I want to step through a couple of specific event types that I think are, are very important um, to become familiar with when you're, when you're getting started. The first is the bro process event. If you've uh, you know, done the, the hello, hello world um, example, your print statement is gonna go in this bro init event. It, as you might have guessed, is uh, triggered when bro starts up. Um, this is where you're gonna do your work with log streams. You're gonna create log streams, apply log filters, <coughs> things of that nature. Um, the, other, the other main the significant event that's uh, tied to the bro process itself is bro done. And of course, that is that's triggered when Bro's uh, shutting down. Uh, the next category of event that I want to talk about is the connection state events. Um, new connection is what it sounds like. It's an uh, event that is triggered when Bro observes a new connection that it wasn't previously tracking. Not much is known about the new connection at this point. Um, when Bro sees the response, say in, in the case of a TCP session, uh, sees the SYN act in response to the, that initial SYN. It triggers the connection established event. Now I noted here that it's, this is actually not the completion of three-way handshake in TCP, um, but from this point, Bro is, is kind of tracking the connection as a connection, tracking the state of the connection. Uh, the next event is the connection remove, or connection state remove event. And this is when Bro is, is kind of finished wrapping up, it's finished its analysis of the communication. Um, all of the protocol an analyzers, or any of the protocol analyzers that have run on the session um, have completed their work and they've populated all of the, the metadata at this point. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the UDP session done event. Um, one of the things when, when you start talking about Bro and events, um, and mention the connection record, people say, well, what about UDP? And this is, this is actually um, what the, the Bro authors have done to kind of make 
UDP handling a little more TCP-like uh, for interacting with, with these uh, events in the programming language. So to kind of step into this a little bit deeper, uh, the connection state remove event is triggered and contains a connection record. Uh, that record has a number of fields. Um, I, would, I kind of wish I had, had showed it's a sample of this, these events to show fields and values, um, but I'm just field names for now. Um, the ID field is going to be your kind of the five tuple network flow information, your IPs and ports, and your transport protocol. Um, the port type in Bro actually includes the transport protocol that was used. Um, so this is actually, this is also a record, this ID field. Um, it's only four fields, but the transport protocol can be inferred from the port. Um, the orig and response, or RESP fields here, um, also are record fields. They correspond, of course, to the originator and responder in this communication. Um, this is going to contain bytes transferred, packets transferred, um, some state information um, from the perspective of those endpoints. Um, the history field is also kind of interesting. Uh, this is uh, kind of a, a tracking of uh, connection state uh, from the perspective of both endpoints. And if you're having trouble with drop packets or asymmetric routing, um, you're going to see some evidence of that in this history field. So in addition to all that, um, the connection record also has a number of optional fields that correspond to some of the application layer protocol analyzers. So if any of these analyzers, one of these analyzers ran, um, you're going to be able to access uh, the, that protocol information right from this connection record within this event handler. Um, so you know, in the case of HTTP, uh, you'd be actually be able to reference the, the user agent or refer field directly from this connection record. It's kind of, kind of useful. Access to a ton of information at this stage in the, the analysis process. So um, I mentioned uh, earlier that one of the other primary outputs, um, at least like more useful outputs uh, from my perspective, I guess, um, is the bro's ability to carve files out of traffic streams. And I just wanted to step through some of the, the events that are related to file analysis in bro. The first is file new, uh, kind of like the connection new event. Um, that's triggered when Bro begins analyzing a new file. File sniff, alternatively, is, a, is an event that's triggered after Bro has analyzed, analyzed the first chunk of that file. And the first chunk, it, it runs a signature match on, on the file header and attempts to make a, a, a determination of what kind of file it is using the, the MIME type. So at this point, when this event is triggered, Bro has done a little bit of analysis of the file and attempted to identify the file type. And that, that information, that meta information, is available um, in this event handler. So both of these events can be used to attach analyzers. And when you're talking file analysis, that might be a hash analyzer or an extract analyzer, depending on, on what your use case or goals are. Um, but it's just important to know that file sniff, if you're going to attach, say you want to extract files of a certain type, you can use file sniff to make that determination. Check the MIME type field and then attach the extract analyzer if that's what you need to do. The last event that I wanted to mention regarding file analysis is the file state remove event. And this is triggered, as you might have guessed, uh, when Bro is kind of has completed its analysis of the file and it's, it's going to shut down its state tracking. Um, this is kind of notable because at this point, if you've attached an extract analyzer, um, that extracted file is now sitting on disk. And within this event handler, you can, you can do things with that file. You can move it to another directory, uh, submit it to an API, things of that nature. So something to be useful, uh, be aware of there. Um, again, kind of to step through the, step into the uh, file state remove event, that's triggered with an FA underscore file record. And this is kind of Bro's um, record or container for all of the, the metadata that it collects for the file. The ID field in this case is not your network flow information. This is the unique ID of the file itself from Bro's perspective. Um, source is going to reflect the source, uh, probably an application layer protocol, the, the transfer mechanism um, that the, through which the file was discovered. And the info record or the info field here is actually the info record from the file's framework. 
And the, these are two separate things. Uh, the files framework, um, this info record from the files framework is going to contain all kinds of, of metadata uh, about the file as it was analyzed by Bro. Um, so you can access, you actually access that metadata even uh, by handling this event. Of course, the total scene and missing bytes are important. Um, if you're extracting files in particular, you having, you're having problems with uh, errors related to truncated files and things like that, you definitely want to take a look at this missing bytes field and make sure that you're getting every, everything for the file. Um, kind of like the connection record, um, the fa underscore file uh, record also includes some protocol specific fields. Uh, if the HTTP, IRC, or FTP protocol analyzers ran, these fields are going to be populated and accessible in this event. So uh, I talked about the connection state, bro process, and file analysis. Um, I just wanted to throw out this massive list of other application or protocol related um, uh, protocol analyzers that generate events. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics here. Johanna just detailed a number of events that are, are generated by SSL or will be generated by SSL and X509. Um, but just be aware that there is a ton of information out there as Bro is going through its analysis process for these sessions. It's triggering events for each stage, typically each stage of that, that analysis process. And um, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's very useful, tons of information that can be gleaned from handling these events. So one of the things I wanted to do in this talk is kind of try to lay some foundation for people just getting started with the language in particular. Um, and then provide some references, some pointers to, to more information um, to kind of continue to, to look into the subjects I just uh, outlined there. The top URL is a, is a list of um, protocol independent events that Bro generates. Um, these are going to be events that Bro Core itself generates, um, the connection state remove, um, file sniff, uh, file new. Those are all actually generated by Bro Core. Second URL here. I apologize, that's hard to see. Um, this is a list of the Bro plugins, or plugins that ships with Bro. And in, in particular, this will give you an idea of um, all the protocol specific events that, uh, that these protocol analyzers generate. As you browse this URL, you'll see a big list of, of, um, of script files that uh, have event declarations in them. Um, and then the last URL here is just a link to the uh, files framework, specifically the log files event. Um, that is the event that's, that's specifically generated by the files framework. And that's generated when um, that file metadata, that, that collected metadata is actually being written out to the files log. Um, I mentioned the files info record before, and that's, this event is where you're going to find that. So. Um, just talked about events. Um, I want to step into the, um, the output, specifically the log streams and um, log filters, which I think is a great capability of Bro. Um, we as network defenders and network traffic analysts, uh, kind of one of, pro one of our primary tasks is to categorize the, the data that we're working with, um, understand what's incoming and what's outgoing, um, if it's uh, internal web server or external web server. Um, just kind of break that down into to more useful buckets, understandable buckets. Um, as most of us know, uh, Bro has two uh, output formats for its logs. The first is tab delimited. That's a native format. Um, Bro ships with a command line tool called Bro Cut. Um, and that's, that's built to work with this tab delimited format. Um, if, you're, if you're into using aw, uh, grep, grep, awk, and sed um, and working on the command line, uh, that's probably the format for you. Um, it also supports JSON, and uh, that's, you know, if you want to do a, a little bit, uh, you want to interface with Bro event data from a, a programming language, there's a, a number of, of libraries out there that uh, can read and write JSON. Um, so that might be a, a useful event format for you. Um, if you want to turn on JSON, Bro makes this very easy. And this is kind of the first code example of, of several that I'm going to throw up. On the screen here, um, I have this all this code uh, in a text file. If you want any of it, just you know, feel free to hit me up in the lobby or anything. Um, but just wanted to, to, to highlight some of the features of the language by stepping through some of these examples 
of, of, of tasks that we find ourselves needing to accomplish. Uh, so in this case, we just want to turn on JSON logging, and we're going to use the readf statement. Um, this is a, a major, major component of the language, uh, something that you're going to use frequently. It's kind of the, the built-in mechanism for uh, adjusting parameters and, and turning the knob, so to speak. Um, in this case, we're just going to redef the use JSON attribute or variable of the log ASCII module. We're going to set that to true. And then we're also going to specify a JSON timestamp format down here, the ISO standard 8601. So very simple, very straightforward. You could drop this into your local.bro policy file, bro control deploy, and it's, you're off and running. Uh, this is just an example of the tab delimited format. Uh, you can actually, there's a configuration option to turn off um, the, the, the bulk of that header section there to where you just have the, the fields row. Um, if that's something that you're uh, interested in. And then conversely, this is, the, uh, this is a JSON formatted example of the same event. Now, one thing, while JSON is, is great to work with pro programmatically, um, one thing that uh, sometimes gets overlooked, if you're ingesting JSON in a tool where you're paying um, by your, your index volume consumption, maybe on a daily rate, um, JSON can, can have a major impact on the size of an event. And you can see some of these field names are actually longer than these field values. And that's, that's kind of where you pay for it. Uh, it. It can actually literally cost you money. Um, so just something to be aware of. <laughs> if you're using tools that, 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 that might impact you. So um, I mentioned that uh, you, know, you can very simply turn on JSON formatting for Bro, and that's kind of a global configuration if you, if you define that readf statement at the top level. But Bro allows you to attach more than one filter to a log stream, and that's kind of a, a very cool, very useful feature, in particular if you're doing uh, dev or testing. Um, so in this case, I'm actually going to uh, duplicate a log stream, I create the tab delimited format and also the JSON format. And I'm going to do that by, uh, th this is going to be done in the bro init event handler. I mentioned that before, it's a bro process oriented event. Um, this is where all your work with your log streams is going to take place. Um, and I'm going to actually grab a copy of the default filter that's attached to the con log. And I'm going to change the name of that filter just using the cat function and appending the string dash JSON to the, the filter name. And I'm also going to do the same thing for the path. And this is actually going to be the name of the file that these events will show up in on disk. And then we're going to pass uh, this table, this inline table construct, to the config field. And again, this is turning telling Bro to use JSON and specifying the uh, timestamp format that we saw just a, a couple slides ago. There. Uh, very, very exact same thing here, just done in kind of a different way. Uh, let's see. So the last component here is to actually add this filter back to the log stream, and that's, used, that's done just simply by using the add filter function here. So um, sometimes people, yeah, I get it. You can duplicate log streams and, and generate more data than um, you originally had. What if I just want to turn off a log stream? Well, that, that's very easy to do, too. Um, just use the disable stream function and specify the, the log ID um, that you want to disable. You can, you can stack these, uh, these, these commands so you can disable mul multiple streams. Um, lots of flexibility here on, on how you can do that. So another uh, nice feature of the log filters is to include only certain fields in, these, in the log output, and that's simply done by using the include option. Um, just as syntactically, I just wanted to point out something here. Um, you see I have the, the, the set declaration um, and the lines, or excuse me, the, there's new lines separating these commas here, so it's formatted kind of vertically. Uh, syntactically, that works perfectly fine. You're going to see that a lot in the language and in, in, in the source code in particular. It's uh, functionally the exact same thing as that. What, not, what isn't allowed is that, and that's both of them. Uh, 
I just thought that kind of looked funny. Um, so instead of just including certain fields in the log stream, maybe you want to remove certain fields from the log stream. Um, and you can do that with the exclude option or the exclude field. Now this is a little bit of a different uh, approach to doing the same kind of thing. Uh, in this case, I'm going to remove the default filter from the SMTP log, and then I'm going to replace it with a new filter that I'm defining in line here. Uh, the filter name is going to be no SMTP recipients, and I'm going to pass a set of strings. Those strings would be the field names that I want to exclude. We're going to pass that as an as a argument to the exclude field. Okay, so uh, continuing on, um, in other cases, you may only want to log select events. And this is something, you know, um, it, again, uh, maybe you have limited disk space or you're paying um, by a daily index volume and you can't, you, you know, just simply can't afford to write everything. Um, you, can, you can do that very easily with this uh, predicate option. And it's a, the field is abbreviated as uh, pred here. Um, and this is done by passing a function that returns a Boolean. Uh, this is a, a Boolean, so if the, the test is true, then the event will be written to the log stream, and the test is false, it won't. That's very simple. Um, the syntax here is kind of, kind of confusing uh, for if you're just getting uh, familiar with the language. Um, this is the, uses the return statement and returns the output if this if the originating host is a local, is not a local address. So if that condition is true, then it returns true, and the event will be written to the log. Another very cool feature, and the last, uh, kind of the last thing I'm gonna mention about log filters, is that uh, you can use a, what's called a path function to determine what log file events actually show up in. And it's, it kind of works in the very same way that the uh, predicate option or the predicate field works. Um, you can define a function and then pass it to this filter. And then every time an event is triggered and getting ready to be written to the log stream, this, this condition would be evaluated and then um, the, the event would be routed to the, the correct log stream based on that condition. So in this case, I'm just defining this sort mail function and using, again, I mentioned before, the local zones and local nets variables from the site module, um, using some of these built-in functions to determine if this was an incoming or outgoing email. Um, and these are simple categorization that can make you, you know, your analysis tasks a little bit easier um, when you sit down to, to review these events. So to find the function, all it's doing is checking to see if the originating host is local and the response, responding host is is not local, and if it is, it's gonna be called an outgoing email, and if the, the inverse is true, then we're gonna call it an incoming email. Um, so in this case, we're gonna remove the default filter from the SMTP log and then add a filter back, and as I mentioned before, we're just gonna pass this sort mail function as an argument to the path func field. So um, we talked a lot about uh, log filters uh, over the past couple of slides. Um, maybe you're not, you, you've kind of sliced and diced your logs to the, to the extent that you, you really wanted to, and you want to start adding information to these log fields. And that's, uh, that's something that, that Bro also makes very easy. Um, so I want to step through an example of how that would be done. Uh, for this example, I'm going to use a, a metric that's uh, known as the producer-consumer ratio. And this is actually something that was taken from a talk that uh, a gentleman, a, a couple of gentlemen, uh, Carter Bullard and John Gerth did at Flowcon in 2014. Uh, PCR is described as a normalized value indicating directionality of application information transfer independent of data load or rate. So it's a, it's, it's a calculation done using the, the application bytes from the, the originator and responder and I, I, I like this, this metric. I, I think it's a very useful kind of quick reference way to get a sense for data flow in a, in a network communication. So um, to add this field, I'm gonna add this field. To, to, I want the, this field to show up in the connection log. So what I'm gonna do is extend the con info record and add this PCR field. 
I'm going to use the log attribute. Uh, this is important uh, if, you're, if you're new to the language. Um, you be, very, be very mindful of these attributes. Um, you have to use this log attribute if this field is going to show up in the, in the log file. And that's something that, you know, when you're getting started, this is frequently overlooked. I did it myself many times. Um, and it's also, uh, if, if you're not going to require this field, it's also useful to include the, the optional attribute here. Um, in certain situations, maybe there were no bytes transfer, transferred or the, the bytes uh, fields weren't populated for some reason. Um, you want to be able to catch those situations and, and not blow things up. Ooh, timing's awful on this. Uh, so um, the next step, I've, I've at, extended the ConInfo record, and that includes, now includes the PCR field. The next step is to populate that field. And that's going to be done by handling the connection state remove event. Um, I wanted to point out that the priority of this event, and I talked about priorities a, a few slides back, the priority of this event is three. Um, the first thing I'm going to check is to see that the ORIGE and response bytes fields are there, are present. And this is the syntax uh, for doing so. Uh, when I first saw the syntax, I was a little confused by this. Um, but this is the syntax to, to make sure that a record field exists. Um, the next uh, test here is a, uh, a value test. And, and this is just sim simply an example of how you can catch situations. Um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is uh, avoid dividing by or into zero. Um, so I'm going to catch the situation where the originating and response bytes are both equal to zero. <coughs> and set that statically to 0, 0.0. And finally, uh, if we get past those conditions, uh, we're going to come down to the bottom and perform the calculation and then add that value to the PCR field. So um, now we've added a field to the stream. And let's just say, hypothetically, I've, I've saved that script off and called it calculate PCR. It's sitting in, in my local scripts directory. Um, and I want to start working with this metric. I want to start uh, kind of formulating some, some pointed analysis approaches. Um, and I want to apply it to, uh, to HTTPS and try to, try to determine if there's been uh, files transferred over HTTPS. Because again, of course, it's encrypted. And uh, you can't see that. And we're not going to be able to carve the file out of the stream. So I'm going to do that in three parts. We're going to set up the, the script environment, um, authoring a new script here, adding a new log stream. I'm going to set up the script environment. I'm going to create the log stream. And then eventually, I'm going to write events to that stream. So this starts with uh, the load directive. I mentioned that early on. Um, the first thing I want to do is make sure that that calculate PCR script is loaded. Um, I'm also going to call the, uh, sites mod the site module. Um, this is just kind of a matter of best practice. If you're going to use functions that are defined by another module, it's good to make sure that they exist and they've been loaded. Um, and then the next step here is to define the, uh, the module namespace, in this case, HTTPS transfer. Uh, we're going to move on and continue setting up the script. We're going to define the export block. Uh, we're going to add the log ID to the log ID enum. And then we're going to define the info record. And by convention, um, when you create a new log stream, um, you define a record. You typically want to name that record info. Um, and this is where you're going to set the columns that are going to show up in your log stream. In this case, um, including the timestamp, the unique ID from the connection record, uh, my IP information, the PCR value, and then some information from the SSL exchange. And finally, the last event or excuse me, the last statement down here is to uh, declare the log HTTPS transfer. And that's going to be the event that is generated whenever uh, an event is written out to this log stream. So the next step um, in, in authoring this script would be to create the log stream itself. And uh, as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is going to be done in the bro, in, bro init event handler. Um, specifically using the create stream function. Um, we're just specifying um, the HTTP uploads. Uh, 
I'm sorry, that's a, that's a typo there. Uh, this is supposed to be HTTP transfers, a uh, log identifier. Um, and then also we're gonna pass the log stream record. And in this, we're just defining this log stream record in line here, um, specifying the HTTPS transfers info object as um, for the argument for the columns field, the log HTTPS transfer as the event, and then defining the path, which is again, the file name these events are gonna show up in as HTTPS transfers. Um, so the, the next and final step is actually write, write events out to this stream. Um, this is gonna be done again in the connection state remove event handler. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, in this situation, there's a number of ways you can do this. Um, but in this situation, I use a priority of zero. I think zero is actually the default priority for event handlers if you don't specify one. Um, the point is that this, would be, this handler would be executed later than the previous event handler that populated the PCR field. Um, in this case, I'm just uh, uh, gonna do so, a, a value test on the PCR field. But also wanted to mention here, again, to reiterate best practice um, when you're writing bro script in, in any programming language for that matter, um, just make sure that the field that you're operating on is going to exist in the record. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing here with the, uh, the syntax, the question mark, uh, dollar sign syntax. Um, this is the kind of the remainder of that event handler. I had to, to truncate that, sorry about that. Um, and you know, again, I've instantiated a, a local instance of the info record and I'm populating all the fields using information out of the connection record that was contained in the uh, connection state remove event. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out too, another little syntax thing that kind of blew my mind when I initially saw it, um, and this is this uh, con conditional statement down here at the bottom. Um, it's kind of hard to understand if you're not familiar with it, but essentially what it's saying is if this field exists, then use the value of the field, um, which would be the value, the, the SSL subject field to the left of the colon here. And if the field does not exist, just use an empty string. Um, very useful kind of inline way to test values and, and handle uh, situations where you may not have a, a, a value in a field that you expected. Um, the last thing we're gonna do is just use the uh, log write function and write this event out to the log stream. Uh, pretty straightforward. So um, this is a very, very basic script and very limited functionality, tons of ways to expand on this. Um, I think I'm about out of time here, so I'm gonna go ahead and just throw up some URLs to some additional information. Some, uh, the top one here is the script reference. Um, encourage you, if you're, especially if you're getting just getting going with the language to take a look at these, uh, these resources here, very useful. Um, incredibly important when you're, when you're getting going as a, as a programmer. And then the link down here at the bottom is a, is a link to that uh, FlowCon presentation from 2014. A very interesting read, totally recommend you, you check it out. So that's it for me. Uh, any questions? All right, thank you very much.